Good morning, everyone. Aren't you glad that you didn't have to deal with all that traffic going up north? <laughs> that you could just be right here with us today and even pray or online or our campuses. Aren't you glad that you're not out there in the sun and the boat and dealing with all the chaos? <laughs> glad you're here today. I don't want to be by myself. I want to talk to you about a hymn that um, I grew up as a kid singing, and the older I got and, and the more that I would hear this hymn, it began to deeply resonate with me, especially the third stanza of it. In fact, you're going to be singing it after the message along with some other great ways that you'll have to worship God as well. But uh, this, this song in particular has... Um, has really resonated with me, and, it, and I'll be honest with you, it, it troubles me. And, and when I say that it troubles me, I'm not saying that because it's heresy or it's wrong. It troubles me because it's so dead aim accurate. The hymn uh, was written by a Methodist minister. His name was Robert Robinson. He wrote it in the mid-1700s. And um, you have probably heard it. It's been kind of changed a little bit and put in different format. But it's the hymn that begins this way. It says, Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. And then Robert writes, Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it. Mount of God's unchanging love. I just, that, that I love that first stanza. It just speaks so much about God's grace and God's goodness to us. In the second stanza, he says, Here I raise my Ebenezer, which is like a standard or a stone. Hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me, he said, when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. In other words, he intersected my life. Actually, uh, he was quite a scoundrel before uh, he came to faith, and he actually went with some others to hear the great preacher George Whitfield preach when he was in England, and with the intention of mocking Whitfield. Can you imagine that? Uh, harassing him, and instead God's word pierced him and, and changed his life at that, at that meeting, that sermon that he heard. But here's the, here's the verse that bothers me that he writes. It's the last verse. He says, O to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. I, I am, and so are you, right? We, are all, we can never pay God back for what he's done for us. Let that grace now, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. And I, I, I see that, I hear it, and it's like, yep, that's what I want. I want, to be, I want to be bound to the heart of Jesus, all right? Now, here's the part that bothers me. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for that courts above. It's that prone to wander part. It's that prone to leave part. And, and, and he talks about that. He uses wander at least twice in this, uh, or three times actually, if you go back further in the song, and then this idea of leaving. And, and the reason that bothers me is because when I, when I hear that, when I sing that, Something inside of me goes, yep, that's true about me. I am prone to wander. I am prone to leave the God I love, the God who loves me. And I have to, I have to work hard to keep myself tethered to his heart. How about you? Or am I alone in that? Do you ever just feel that? You ever just wonder, like, what's going on inside of me? Why, do I, why am I prone to wander from God? after experiencing so much of his goodness and grace. Well, I want to ask the question why I think that happens and how we can keep it from happening in our lives. We're back to our series, uh, Grasping God's Big Story. If you remember, we started out the series way back when. Uh, we looked at how in the very beginning everything was good, and then we looked at how sin ruined it. Now we're talking about how God brings us back into right relationship with himself. The theological term is redemption. He, he, buy, you know, he buys us back with the blood of his own son. And last weekend, we, we uh, emphasized the importance of the gospel, that the gospel is what, is what brings us back to God because the gospel is this great news how Jesus died our death for us 
so that we can live his life. It's everything he's done for you and me. It has nothing to do with us. He just says, trust me. He just says, trust me. So I kind of encapsulated last week's message in, in a simple statement that goes like this. By faith in who Jesus is and what he has accomplished, we can now be in a right relationship with our Father in heaven. Would you say that with me out loud? By faith in who Jesus is and what he has accomplished, we can now be in a right relationship with our Father in heaven. I like that. <laughs> Which then, you know, causes me to wonder, why am I prone to wander away from that right relationship that God has given to me? And to answer that question, we're going to look again in the book of Romans. I've asked Pastor Richard, our worldwide pastor, come. He's going to read from God's Word, so let's stand together in honor of God's Word. Romans chapter 1, Romans 1, and verse 18 through 25. Richard. Romans 1, 18 to 25. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their heart desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys can be seated. Thank you. Um, Paul wrote those words to believers who were living in and around Rome, just like, just like you and me. And what he does, he says, you know, I, 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 I've told you that you've been, you've been saved by the gospel. You've been saved by what Christ has done for you. But it's like Paul says, now, I want to kind of go back. I want to talk about the, the human condition, the darkness of the human soul. Because there's, there's, there's something from your past that is still there. It's, it's part of human nature. And I really need you to be careful with it because if you're not, it's, it's going to move you away from God rather than to God. It's that prone to wonder part of us. In order to expose it, what Paul does is he kind of talks about what our lives were like before uh, we became followers of Christ. He talks about, you know, why the world is the way it is, why people are the way they are. And he begins with a pretty bold assertion. He basically says, you know, every human being knows the truth that there is a God. Every human being knows the truth that there is a God. And then he talks about natural revelation. He just says, look around you. I mean, the last week here in Minnesota has been just beautiful, hasn't it? And uh, you, just, you just, you know, go down to the lake or walk through the woods if, if your allergies don't take your life before that. Uh, I doubled up on antihistamines yesterday. That was not a good idea. I was ready to run a race last night. But anyway, it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful. And, and for me, at least, it always triggers me to think about God. And so what Paul is saying is this, he's saying, you know, creation was made the way it was because God's trying to tell us something about himself. There's an author by the name of Michael Kendrick. He wrote a book called Your Blueprint for Life. And in it, he says, he says you know, if God, if God, wanted to be anonymous, if, if God kind of wanted to keep to himself, he wouldn't have done everything he did in creation. It reminds us, you know, I mean, think about the Milky Way, for instance, all those stars out there. I don't know about you, when I look up into the starry night, uh, I just think about eternity. I think about God. Or he says, how about the swirling galaxies? Like this, this is amazing what, what the modern metal telescopes can do these days. This is the, the galaxy Betelgeuse. That's literally what it's called. Or, or how about, uh, you know, 
the, the Rocky Mountains, the towering Rockies, or, or the vast ocean, or you get to something as beautiful and as mighty as a little hummingbird. Just, you know, these amazing creatures, these amazing things that God has done, just to shout at us and say, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. You know, it's almost like Michelangelo when he painted the Sistine Chapel. You know, the, the, the result of that is something was going on inside of his mind and his heart. He just simply got it out in art form and then and put it out for everybody to be in awe and of and to enjoy. And it's like what God does in creation. He takes what's inside him, so to speak, and he just paints it, right? And we're part of it. So we can be in awe of him. Now, all of that is not going to save anybody. It's not going to redeem us, right? But it's meant to point us to a redeemer. It's meant to cause us to call out and to seek out God who then, who then shows us his son and then shows us in his son how our lives might be reconciled to him again. But Paul says in that passage of scripture, he says, you know, what happens to us is, is we, won't, we won't let it take us to Christ. We stop with the creation and then we make a God out of the things that God has made. Or if we don't do that, even after we come to faith in Christ, we have a tendency to drift away from God and once again drift back into, you know, wanting to worship what God has made rather than worshiping God himself. And the words that he uses there in the Greek means we literally, you know, he goes, the human race literally pushes, presses down the truth. In order to embrace a lie. Look at that passage. Here's what he said in verse 20 when he says, Yes, they know God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. They began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. I want to hold that verse there for a moment because in this verse we have a clue as to what causes us to wander. We have a clue as to what causes people not to follow the trail and end up with the true and living God. And Paul says it has to do with ungratefulness. It has to do with not being thankful. And he says the result of it is, look what he said, the result of it is we think up all kinds of foolish ideas, which is kind of a commentary on our world and our, and our culture today, isn't it? Now, what does, what does Paul mean when he says we're ungrateful? We're not, we're not thankful, and that's what kind of causes us to wander away from God, whether we're a follower of Christ or whether we're a pagan out there, right? Well, Tim Keller, when he talks about this, says, you know, that idea of being um, ungrateful, another way to understand it is the whole idea of plagiarism. You know what plagiarism right, is, right? Plagiarism is when I write something or I... And by the way, everybody here is a plagiarist to some degree. All right? We all beg and borrow. But true plagiarism is when we write or say something and we don't give credit to the source. So I write or I say something and I, and I do it in a way that it makes it seem like or I literally boldly just claim I came up with it. And I didn't. Plagiarism is saying, I don't want to depend on anybody else. I don't want to acknowledge somebody else said that or did that is smarter or wiser or better than me. It has to be all about me. And so in that sense, all of us, spiritually speaking, are plagiarists because we don't want to acknowledge God as our source. Our nature is we want to be God. Our nature is we want to be our own source rather than Him. And we fight that till our dying day. We fight that. Even after becoming followers of Christ. The intellectualist Al, uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn put it this way in, in a statement. He said, the line dividing good and evil cuts through the center of every human heart. It's kind of like that third stanza, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. That's, that's what we're feeling. Is that line that cuts through us. Paul describes it in a very biographical way. Read it sometime, Romans chapter 7. But if you want to read it in a more simplistic way, just go read Galatians chapter 5. 
Because in Galatians 5, Paul says, look, there is a battle going on inside all of us between God's Spirit living in us, the truth living in us, what we know to be true living in us, and our own flesh, our own small s spirit, which kind of wants to do life our own way, which wants, which wants God to operate according to how we think God should be. You know, if you uh, gather 100 people off the streets and stick them in a room, I bet that if you ask them the question, do you believe there is a God, nearly all, not all, but nearly all would raise their hands. Yes, I believe there is a God. But if you then turned around and explained to them who this God is and, and gave them a, a pretty in-depth description of the God of the Bible, Old and New Testament, and what he has said about all kinds of things and, and, and what he demands and, and what's involved in following him, and then ask, now, how many of you believe in God? I think you'd have far fewer hands that would go up. That's because of this thing in us where we want to be our own source, we want our own independence, and we, we battle that thing every single day. And here's the danger of it. You ready? For you and for me. Here's the danger of it. Every human who does not worship the true God, listen, is going to worship an idol instead. You either worship God or you're an idolater. Doesn't matter if you're an atheist, doesn't matter who you are, you either worship God or you're an idolater. David Foster Wallace passed away in his 40s. Um, he suffered terrible mental depression and he committed suicide. But he was a brilliant writer, English teacher, novelist. He wrote a pretty popular novel called Infinite uh, Jest and uh, was considered one of the top uh, 100 novelists in, 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 his, in our history from about 1900 to the 1990s. And he gave a, a speech uh, at Kenyon College. And I want to read to you a little bit of what he said because he just nails this whole idea of how prone we are to idolatry, how, how when we wander away from God, we wander into idolatry. Now, I don't know that he was a Christian, by the way. I assume from what I've read about him that he was not. But just listen to what he says. He, this is his commencement speech to these students. He writes and he says... In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. If you, if you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. It's the truth, he says. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure, and you'll always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you'll die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. Worship power, you'll end up feeling weak and afraid. You'll never need, and you'll ever need more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart you'll end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. That must have been quite the commencement speech <laughs> to the graduating seniors to have this guy stand up and tell you you're an idolater. And whatever you worship is going to control you. And in his mind, as he laid it out, leave you unsatisfied. So if that's true, and I believe it is, and I believe that's what Paul is saying, is that apart from God, you're going to worship something or someone. And if it's true that our, our nature is to gravitate toward idolatry, right? Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Then the question is, have you, have you wandered into idolatry? Are you worshiping the living God or honestly, have you fallen into idolatry? So how do I know if I've fallen into idolatry? Well, let me give you, uh, and we'll put this in our small groups uh, section, our website. Let me give you kind of a, a test, so to speak. It's not original to me. I don't want to be a plagiarist. This is from 
Pastor Steve Fuller, all right? Here's, here's how it goes. These are penetrating questions. I want to encourage you to think about going through this maybe with your family if, if kids are still at home or your spouse with some friends. Maybe it's something you would be healthy for you to do once every couple of weeks. Put it on your fridge. But here's how it goes. Number one, something is an idol when it causes me to disobey God. Or you could say he or she causes me to disobey God. Number two, it gives me greater joy than Christ. What gives you real joy today? It's funny, someone this morning early on, before any of our services started this morning, asked me about joy. What is joy? Number three, it gives me the most excitement about the future. What excites you about the future? Number four, it is what, it is what I daydream about the most. Like, what are you daydreaming about now? <laughs> Number five, it is what I most enjoy talking about. Number six, it is what I fear losing the most. I think that's really, I think that's one of the most powerful telltale signs of idolatry. What do, I, what do I fear losing the most? Number seven, is it what I most is it what I most enjoy reading about? Number eight. Is it what I most love spending money on? <laughs> Number nine, is it what I look to for heart rejuvenation? Number 10, it is what I most enjoy spending time on. So just some quick questions. Again, go to our website under the small group section. You'll find them laid out there. But just, just in that real quick overlook, is there something that kind of stood out to you? Is there, is there one of those questions that troubles you? Do you sense that there's something more in your life than, than just God? Is, it, is there something else that's grabbing your attention, grabbing your mind, grabbing your heart? It's become an idol to you. And, you know, idols are never satisfied. Idols always take more and give less except for God, who gives everything for you and for me. Are you an idolater today? I, I know there are times I am prone to wander into idolatry, and that's why that song, I guess, is so important to me. Now, here's the deal. Listen, failure to deal with idols always leads to a hardening of the mind and the heart. So you can always tell somebody who's got an issue with idols going on because they become hard-hearted, become hard-hearted towards God, become hard-hearted towards the things of God. Remember what Paul wrote there in Romans? He said this. He said, and they began to what? Think up foolish ideas of what God is like. That's a sign of hard-heartedness. When I start thinking up foolish ideas about what God is like, because I don't like who God represents himself to be. That is, again, such a commentary on our culture and our society today. Psalm 135, the psalmist wrote in verse 15, and said, the idols of the nations are merely things of silver and gold shaped by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak and eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear and mouths but cannot breathe. And those who make idols are just like them as are all who trust in them. That's pretty scary when you become like what you worship. And by the way, idols are more, if you read the Bible carefully, idols are more than just sticks and stones uh, and technology and money and materialists and, and all those things that we tend to idolize. Listen, behind all those things are demonic forces and powers. The Bible makes that really clear. I look at our nation today and I see what's happening on all fronts. And I, I'm convinced, I am convinced there's a lot of spiritual warfare taking place right now. I believe in what the theologians call cosmic um, geography. Go back to the book of Daniel and the, and the influence, the, the influence of unseen powers on physical and material things. It's profound, it's powerful. 
And I think we're in a demonic delusion, in our, this is my own opinion, in our own nation these days. It's the only way I can explain what is going on. And there's a powerful picture of this uh, in God's own people. And that's why I said, you know, you've got to pay attention if you're a follower of Christ because it's in you as much as it is in somebody who doesn't know God to, to bend over toward idolatry. And it's that story of the Israelites in Exodus chapter 32 when they start worshiping the golden calf. Remember that story? Maybe you need a little reminder. Let me just read a part of it to you, beginning at verse 1. It says, When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down from the mountain, remember he went up to get the law, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. Now, why would they do that? Remember, they came out of Egypt where there was all kinds of idolatry around them. They said, we don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So Aaron, he's really dumb, Aaron said, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. All the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. And Aaron took the gold, melted it down, molded it into the shape of a calf. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, oh, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Aaron saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar in front of the calf. Then he announced, tomorrow, we're going to have a festival to the Lord. See, remember God said, thou shalt have no graven image of me? That's what they're doing. They're making a graven image of God. They're dumbing God down into, a, into an object that allows them, in essence, to control God. Verse 6, the people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. After this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. The Lord told Moses, quick, go down the mountain. Your people whom you brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. How quickly they have turned away from the way I commanded them to live. They have melted down gold and made a calf, and they have bowed down and sacrificed to it. They are saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I just want to share very briefly with you a couple of things that idolatry did to Israel and idolatry does to anybody, anybody who practices it, whether we're talking about individuals or even nations. Number one, it distorts reality. Idolatry always distorts reality. And it always distorts reality because whatever I create, I give it a reality. And that's why we can run around these days saying, my, you know, that's your truth, this is my truth. We distort the fact that there is a truth. It causes spiritual blindness. Why? Because I'm focused on my idol. I'm not focused on God. This is what's fascinating. Idolatry, and this is true inside and outside of the Bible, okay? And my parents, I mentioned last week, and were missionaries in a very pagan place. And you heard about the Bible, Right? But idolatry always, always, always leads to immorality. There's a whole, you know, there's a whole probably PhD dissertation on that one. But idolatry always leads to immoral behavior, which tells me that our nation is headlong into idolatry. Idolatry always gives you a false sense of dependence. I got my idol. This is my philosophy. This is what I believe. This is what I'm trusting in. And idolatry always creates an emotional attachment. We become attached to that which we find our salvation in. We may not even know why we're attached to it, but because it gives us a sense of fulfillment temporarily, we become focused on it. And so Paul says, you know, if that's the way you want to be, he said the worst thing can happen is God says, okay, if that's what you want to be, I'll hand you over to your idols. That is the worst thing thing in the world. Oscar Wilde, who lived a very sensual life, fascinating individual, died miserably, said, when the gods want to punish you, they answer your prayers. When the gods want to punish you, they answer your prayers. Tim Keller put it this way, he said, our enemies are the unchecked and strongest desires of our heart. Same thing of what Wilde said. Our enemies are the unchecked and strongest desires of our hearts. 
Because apart from Christ, as uh, Dallas Willard said, apart from Christ, the heart always, always travels to wickedness, always travels to evil. That's why Jeremiah said, who can know the depth of the evil in a person's heart? Now, some of you are thinking to yourself, is there any good news today? The answer is yes, all right? Because Paul tells us what the key is to avoid having that happen in our lives. The key to keeping idols out of your life is to maintain, you ready? Maintain a posture of praise and thanksgiving. We finished the last service like you're going to do it in worship. We had the choir and the orchestra up here. It was, it was potent. It was so powerful. See, what keeps us from idolatry, what keeps us from wandering is when we maintain a posture of praise and thanksgiving for all that God has done and is doing for us. When we live in praise, when we live in thanksgiving, when we get a clear picture, it's, it's you don't want to wander. But that's an act of the will. I have to make that choice. Again, let me just give you a couple thoughts about that and I'll close. One of the things that maybe some of us need to do, I know I need to work on this, is begin shifting my focus away from myself. You know, one of my constant prayers is, Lord, forgive me for any self-interest. Help me to lose all self-interest. I pray it every day because I'm terribly interested in myself every day. And so are you. Lord, help me to get my focus away from, from myself only to you by daily recognizing your goodness, by daily recognizing your provisions, your life, your creativity that's all around me. You find what you look for. If you'll intend every day to look for God, I promise you, you'll find him. It's a different way to live, isn't it? Number two, cultivate contentment by focusing on what you have rather than what you lack. Cultivate. You got to cultivate Thanksgiving. You got to wear those grooves into your mind. So, so be thankful for what you have. Stop thinking about what you don't have. You know, Marsha and I, when we first started out in ministry, we lived in a, a trailer. We drove a, a rust bucket car. We had our first child, and our highlight of the week was to go to Bob's Big Boy and have the lunch buffet on Thursdays in Port Clinton, Ohio. You know, I look at that now, and I thought, wow. You know, and I think, that, that was miserable. But you know, we were very content back in those days. We were actually happy. And now that we've accumulated more as time goes on, it's harder to be content. Isn't that interesting? Cultivate an ad attitude of contentment with what you have. Number three, recognize and be thankful to the giver. And while you are recognizing and being thankful to the giver, don't, and I know this is going to sound a little bit weird, all right, don't think that you deserve all the gifts that you've been given. Be thankful to God, but don't, but don't think you deserve all those gifts that you have. Because our tendency is to focus on the gifts, and that's what gets us in trouble. Number four, live generously enough to keep yourself dependent on God. Some of the happiest people in the world are the most generous people in the world. Because it's not about them, right? And it keeps them dependent on God. And last but not least, regularly engage, and this is what we're going to do now, regularly engage in private and, listen, public praise and thanksgiving to God. The Bible says, forsake not to assemble yourselves together. And one of the reasons why is we, you know, we need to come together. There's something that happens when, as a community, we give praise and worship to God from our hearts. The Bible says God inhabits praise. And that's what we're going to do now. In these next few minutes, we're just going to spend some time praising our God, thanking our God, worshiping our God, and reminding ourselves how foolish it is to ever wander away.
from his majesty and his presence. Father, as we worship you, I just thank you that it's an opportunity for us to leave our idols, if we have any, at the foot of the cross and to make you, Lord, and you alone the center and the focus of our lives. Lord, I pray that from this message forward that we'll adopt a new mindset, a new attitude, one of praise and thanksgiving. And not fall into illusion that this world offers us, oh God, that what it has is better than what you offer us. We thank you that you are the living God. We thank you and praise you that we can worship you this day. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune our hearts to the love of Christ in Jesus' name.